Hi, everybody. My name is Bobby Harrington, and I have the privilege of leading discipleship.org. And today I have a very special privilege because I get to talk to um, my co-laborer, um, a disciple of Jesus, and somebody that I consider a friend, and that's Drew Heehan. And uh, Drew is joining us from New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, Drew, welcome. Thanks, Bobby. Such a, an honor to be here and really, really grateful for this conversation, your work, and really such a vital, important ministry um, and topic for really for now and the future and in the past. So thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, so grateful to have you with us now. For folks who don't know you, Drew, can you give us a little bit of background on you, your ministry, just kind of where you labor as a leader in God's kingdom? I'm currently in New York City. Uh, back in 2012, uh, we started what's become a family of churches here in New York City called Hope Church NYC, which is now multiplied into a few different Hope Churches across the city. Uh, and I am currently the lead pastor of our Midtown congregation. And um, in addition to that, I, we, my friend and I, Edwin Colon, we co-founded a, a network for urban churches called, um, an urban church planning called the New City Network, which is a church planning network that really um, centers around five values, urban, multi-ethnic, spirit, emotional health, and mission. And so, and a lot of that, the legacy of not only Hope Church, as well as um, New City Network is really stems from my um, journey with Pete Scazzaro. Uh, Pete is the author of Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, along with Emotionally Healthy Spirituality and other books. And Pete was my boss and mentor and spiritual dad for 10 years at New Life Fellowship in Queens. So prior to planning a church, I was on staff with Pete during very formative years of my own life and discipleship uh, for 10 years and learned a tremendous amount and so since then, you know, all the work that we do, really the fingerprints of his life um, and him and Jerry, his wife, uh, their influence on me and my wife, Tina, and our lives um, is really, really significant. And of course, and all of that is kind of stems from what does it mean to follow Jesus well and to do it deeply and in a meaningful way that would really sustain us for the long run in ministry. Talk to us, uh, if you would, about what it means to have emotionally healthy discipleship, just like broadly as we enter into this. Yeah. What does that well, mean? Yeah. And I, I think, I think people might think it's maybe an add on to the Jesus way of discipleship or something like that. But really when we talk about the emotional component of discipleship, it's often a missing piece that um, I think our Western mind and world kind of often miss. And a lot of times when it comes to discipleship and disciple making, so much of it is focused on behaviors and metrics related to behaviors. So the outward signs of a disciple, it means that I'm going to be praying this much. I'm going to be reading scripture this much. I'm going to be reading this much content or books. And almost as if, if I do enough of those outwardly behavioral things, then somehow I'm going to be transformed inwardly into the, to the kind of the image and likeness of Jesus. And really the emotional health discipleship, when we talk about that, what we're talking about is a discipleship that goes beneath the surface. So that um, it's, it goes beyond simply the practices that I, I practice and the disciplines that I carry. But what does it look like to allow those disciplines and those practices to actually transform me deeply in, in the parts of my heart and soul that oftentimes I don't let anyone in, especially even God. So for instance, the image that we often use is the image of an iceberg. And in, in an iceberg, of course, 10% of an iceberg is often above the surface. And so there's 90% below the surface that people don't see. Um, and, and it's that area, those kind of internal areas that we want the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that we want scripture, that we want prayer and formation to deeply to, to touch and to change and transform. So to give you an example, I know that as a young pastor, especially someone who had some upfront gifts, there was this easy propensity to put me in front of crowds and to have me develop in my teaching gift. So I could develop in my teaching gift and I could begin to preach eloquent you know, sermons and to give you know, really long drawn out prayers. And yet on the outside, so people on the outside could see me as this holy, you know, um, person who was close to the heart of God. And yet what people didn't know is that um, I also was someone who was incredibly defensive 
and sensitive when it came to handling conflict. And it was really hard for me to deal with criticism. And because it's hard for me to deal with criticism, that would lead me towards different behaviors, such as my own um, propensity to, to go online and to surf for endless hours and to compare myself to other people. Like there's different shadow areas of my own heart and soul that on the outside though, I had all these gifts. I had these practices that look like on the surface that I was this incredibly humble, you know, uh, tremendous leader and Christian leader. And yet somehow, uh, because I had been fast-tracked on the, the track of discipleship and I had these very visible outward gifts, I, I didn't allow God to touch some of the areas of my own defensiveness, my own sensitivity, my own um, insecurities that led me to some destructive behaviors. And so when we talk about emotionally healthy discipleship, what we're saying is how do we get the stuff of Jesus, um, his love, his compassion, his presence, how do we allow that into that 90% below the surface so that now I'm, I'm giving those insecure parts, I'm giving those easily offendable parts, I'm giving those easily defensive parts, I'm giving all of those, you know, my anxieties, my fears, how am I submitting all of that now to the Lordship of Jesus? And so really that's the invitation of emotionally healthy discipleship is when it comes to our emotional lives, it's not just like, Hey, we ignore these things or we just kind of, we gloss over them with certain practices or certain platitudes, but instead, what does it mean to offer all of that to Jesus and to allow him to transform that? And so really that's the journey that we want to invite people on is to allow the truth of Jesus and following him to allow it to kind of get into the depths of, you know, are, you know, some of the harmful stories and scripts that we've adopted from our family of origin. How, how do I let the gospel begin to transform, um, you know, my addictive behaviors, you know, things like that. Boy, that's good. So let me ask you this. Uh, you had mentioned that this is a, a pitfall or a weakness of um, Western Christianity or maybe American Christianity. What do you mean by that? And why is that the case? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I, and I, I say Western Christianity, but it really is worldwide now, I think, in that oftentimes the measurement of what success looks like, the measurement of what's valued is basically the up and to the right graph. Uh, you know, like, how fast something is growing. And if it grows faster and the slope is higher, then it's almost more celebrated. And what's interesting is that even within the, the evangelical Christian industry, those things often get celebrated. You know, the younger a leader is who starts a significant flowing ministry that's reading, reaching younger populations, um, and this is not to decry that because I think that's all tremendous, but I think that becomes the emphasis of what success is. So as a young leader, then as a young pastor, I can see that as success and, you know, success, fast success, fat, you know, without going through the deeper journey, the deeper journey of, again, allowing Jesus into the, the 90% below the iceberg, um, it can become really dangerous. And it can become, in fact, the thing that leads me to deceive myself into thinking, oh, I'm doing God's work. And yet somehow I've missed this very important piece of what discipleship looks like. And so, so I think, you know, when I talk about American or Western, really, I think it, it plagues the whole world in many ways. And so as a result, I mean, one example, for instance, is, you know, during the pandemic, I think there's been this this wave of, we need to go digital, we need to go digital and look at the reach of what digital is producing, you know, and the number of views and however long people stay on these views of my teaching, you know, um, video or whatever it might be, like that shows what real fruitfulness looks like. So all of a sudden now, the mission during the pandemic for me, I got so caught up in what is everyone doing digitally and how do we expand our reach? And of course, I can baptize that in all sorts of Christian language and make a really good case for why missionally this is effective and why the gospel needs to go forth into unreached places, which is all true. But now all of a sudden, the great commandment, which is to love God and to love others, 
and the great commission, which is to make disciples, which is what discipleship.org is all about. All of a sudden, those things, which are as clear as day, those are, that's the vision statement. And yet somehow the vision statement during the pandemic became for me, how do we expand our reach? How do we, how do we get as many eyeballs to see our church on a screen and to listen to me teaching on a screen? And, and so it, it, it's interesting how subtly like that, just as things shifted, the, the great commandment and the great commission are so clear. And yet now all of a sudden my time is more poured into, okay, how do we expand our digital reach instead of wait, 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 Drew, like, let's make disciples. Let's like, like I need to still be making disciples. Like that's the goal. <laughs> wait, aren't you making disciples when you get more eyes on the screen? Right. Yeah. Isn't that the story you're telling yourself? I know. And it's so easy to get lost in that. And so you know, and oftentimes, I mean, I, it's so funny because, yeah, we, we get so distracted from, I, I don't know if a lot of church growth experts, if they were coaching Jesus back in Jesus's time, like what they would be saying to Jesus about what to do to grow the ministry, whereas versus the choices that he made to grow his ministry, which yeah. was the cost that I think that you're really trying to champion through discipleship.org, the cost of, hey, hey if we've lost this principle and the call to, to making disciples, we've really lost the core of our mission. And yeah. so, um, so anyhow, so that's one example though, of like how I think, and again, I, I don't think it's just American or Western. I know that me growing up as an immigrant here, but being you know born in the States and having been seeped in the American church, I know that it's here. And I know that American Christianity influences the global church. It really um, does. Yeah. So, so that's why I, I say, you know, all of the ways of success ism. And I know Pete in his book, Emotional Healthy Discipleship, he talks about some of these things. Um, you know, the success, success ism that really, um, that so many young leaders and pastors and Christians can succumb to. Well, we, we naturally equate, like you said, up and to the right. So we're making progress and it's looking good. Um, that that's we've been discipled by our culture because mm -hmm. in our culture success is up and to the right yeah and like you said with jesus uh not necessarily so mm -hmm. uh, I, love, I don't know if you've seen this uh tv series the chosen mm -hmm. which is so good because yeah. jesus in that it is uh there dallas jenkins is really showing his investment in people mm -hmm. and how that's a that's a long play. That's, that's not up and to the right because people are messy, uh, but it's authentic. Yeah. Yeah. So good. So Drew, why do we, why do we in the church, we who should know better, not attend to emotional health? Yeah. I know that for me, again, I think it's this illusion of, I mean, there's so much to talk about with this topic, you know, I think number one, there's the illusion of outward behavior equals inward transformation. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think outward behaviors need to lead towards inward transformation, but there needs to be an attentiveness to what those outward behaviors are really pointing at. Yeah. Um, so I think on one end, there's that. I think kind of the history of, you know, Christianity and Greco-Roman thought and philosophy, um, the different kind of the, the divorce of the body, mind, and spirit. And so this belief that somehow we are, as human beings, somehow we're fragmented and, you know, we just focus on certain parts like the mental part or the, uh, the physical part. And we don't see the integration of all of these things. And so one of, one of the theses, for instance, that we have when it comes to emotional healthy discipleship is it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And so, you know, I gave the example of how even uh, growing up as a young person who had some outward gifts, I think that outward gifting gives this belief somehow that if I say the right words, that somehow I'm inwardly mature, but really my maturity I mean, it really comes forward in 
you know, the private halls or the discussions with my wife, <laughs> you know, in the relationships with my children, the relationships with my staff, the relationships with my board, the relationships with people who know me really well, they would know whether I'm submitting myself to the way of Jesus in not just the outwardly stage presence, but is this something that I'm really committed to inwardly and privately? And so I think, I think there's a, a whole set of values in today's culture that focus so much on the exterior. I don't think social media helps this uh, either, because I think social media is so much about glossing over um, and presenting the best version of myself. Yeah. So, and I've, I've fallen into that trap as well. And I get into this comparison trap very easily of just thinking, oh man, these ministries and these people are doing so great. Um, but so I, I just think that the whole culture that we're in, you know, what's interesting, uh, you know, I was just reflecting on how there's been so many technological advancements over, you know, however many years and we're so advanced, but no one has really been able to improve on the moral teachings of Jesus. And so, you know, recently I was preaching on the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the merciful, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And what's so fascinating, I, I was just saying that even myself today, when I think of who is blessed, you know, I think of, oh, blessed are those who have not gotten sick and have remained healthy. Blessed are those who invested in tech stocks during the past year and a half, you know, <laughs> blessed are those who, uh, and their children are all healthy and making lots of money and are secure and all this. It, like, I just realized like the way that even me as a vocational minister, I think of what is blessed today versus the way that Jesus, what he says is blessed. It's just so different. And I need to consistently be shaped by a different story than the one that I'm telling myself that the media is telling me that the culture around me is telling me. And this is where those outward disciplines of scripture and being immersed in scripture of having a devoted prayer life of having a reflective soul and attentive soul to the things that really matter and the way of Jesus. I think that's why that's where those things become so important um, for me. So, you know, and then if you couple all of that with what I was told from my family of origin of what success looks like, success looks like you need to be, uh, really successful. You need to be a really well-known pastor. And if you're going to be a pastor, you need to be really well-known and you need to write lots of books and you need to, I mean, these were the stories that I heard because initially there was resistance to me being a pastor. Then there was, okay, if you're going to be a pastor, then it has to have this certain quality to it. And again, all of these shadow missions get lost in the mission of be a disciple who makes disciples. Hmm. And so, uh, yeah, that's been a continuing. Yeah. Continue that's, on. Drew, this is also good. Let me ask you to elaborate on something you said. You said that um, your spiritual maturity mm -hmm. uh, is directly correlated to your emotional maturity. Yes. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I, I thought you said you cannot have more spiritual maturity than you have emotional maturity. Talk yeah. to us about that. Well, yeah, um, again, there's the great commandment, which is to love God and love others. And then there's the great commission, which is to make disciples of all nations. Now, the great commandment, if it's loving God and loving others, a lot of that, basically, that's the essence of what emotionally healthy discipleship is. How do I love God truly? And how do I love others well? And so if when it comes to emotionally healthy discipleship, so the thing is, I can be a tremendous evangelist, preacher, leader, but really fail at loving God and loving people well. And so that whole thesis of it's impossible to remain sp uh, spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Yeah. Like if I'm someone who people experience me as unloving. Yeah. Because I am defensive. I am scattered or I am overbearing or I am not a good listener, but people experience me on stage as being dynamic, a tremendous preacher, a take charge leader, a visionary, like all of these things that again, we can equate to spiritual maturity. Wow. That person hears from God. I've really missed it. I've really missed it. If people aren't experiencing me as someone who, 
who authentically and deeply loves Jesus, as well as authentically and deeply loves other human beings. And this is where, you know, Jerry Scazzaro, she often says she doesn't, she doesn't listen to pastors anymore. Um, when she, when they, when she asks them how they're doing, she always says, I need to hear it from the spouse. I, I need to hear that because the spouse, I can, I can get wow. a, a better read from the spouse, how someone is really doing because, you know, the spouse knows what's it like Monday th- to Saturday, you know, instead of the Sunday thing, you know? And so, um, so really, so those are some of the things that we talk about when it comes to emotionally healthy discipleship is like, okay, how do I begin to love God well? And how do I begin to love others well as I love myself? And so if I'm not doing the great, so I can be doing the great commission well, in quotes, but failing at the great commandment. Uh, and really what we're saying is, no, no, no. You see these things, they work hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. It's the great commandment and the great commission. You know, I've just got to say how much I appreciate what you're saying. And uh, just as you're talking, Drew, it reminded me of something you and I talked about before the recording. So um, I want to read something to you that of all the texts that I got, this one may have meant the most to me. And it's actually connecting Uh, as an example of just what you're talking about. So a little over a week ago, I came down with COVID-19 or it was like, I got the test and I had COVID-19. And the first thing that I did when I found out is I called my son because I had been with my grand, my brand new grandson, uh, the uh, like uh, 36 hours earlier. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually holding him. He's like a week old and I was holding him. Well, I realized I had COVID-19 when I was holding him. I'm vaccinated. So my sense of, you know, um, the effects of having COVID-19 were greatly diminished. Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that he, he, my, he wasn't even um, two weeks old when he got COVID-19. Mm-hmm. So he's like a week and a half old. He's got COVID-19 on Sunday night. Uh, he's going to emergency. And Drew, I texted you and, mm-hmm. and, and leaders all over the country and the world, really, who I, I knew they prayed and they had prayer teams. I just asked them to pray. And it was, a, it was really hard. One of the um, most meaningful texts I got is from a guy that we have actually had some disagreements on, around some biblical teachings. Mm-hmm. But I still texted him because he's a godly man. And and uh, here's what he, he texted back to me and just notice how he connects at an emotional level. Mm-hmm. He goes, so I sent the text and, and the text was really like, I was desperate because mm-hmm. they had taken him from one hospital in an ambulance to Vanderbilt, which in our area is a, you know, the best hospital. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, please pray for him. And here's the response I got. My heart hurts for you, Cindy, Chad, and Rachel, and Joshua, whose name resonates deeply in my own heart. And I know he had lost to Joshua. Mm-hmm. And until he texted me, I, ooh, he goes, my God, heal this boy who is one of your servants, both now and into the future. Mm-hmm. Our hearts cry out to you. Oh, have mercy, oh Lord. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow. And this is a guy we had just had a debate uh, publicly on a book that he came out with that I, I thought was teaching some unhealthy stuff. And he writes that. And it's like that guy, he knows what it means to love people the way he responded. Mm. That's so beautiful. I mean, and so beautiful of you too. I mean, and gosh, I mean, what a sign of, in, in these polarizing times for you both, for you first, I think to take a step of like, I think you discipled me in your willingness to ask for help because I realized that as someone who's a self-sufficient type, like seeing someone like you, Bobby, who I have tremendous respect for, your simple move of asking for help and for prayer, like that vulnerable move, 
even people that you may not agree with or have the same kind of this, like, I, I think that was so special. And then just to hear that response, there's just such a beautiful, I don't know, beautiful picture of Jesus and the body of Christ and unity in the midst of such a polarizing season. And so, yeah. Well, well, I just thank God. And, you know, uh, I, before the recording started, you and I talked about this and I just said, it really, uh, you know, this whole experience has really made me aware of how important it is that we pray and, mm. and that we pray for each other. Yeah. Like, um, well, trying to um, take it to our audience who's listening or watching Drew what are some key steps if I want to be more emotionally healthy? What are some things that you have found uh, are important things to do uh, mm -hmm. as, as I want to be a disciple or for those who are church leaders with us, if we want to make emotionally healthy disciples? What are some things that you've learned that are good steps as we proceed down this path? Yeah, you know, I, I think one really helpful first step is to simply take inventory. You know, uh, this is basically what the Psalms basically are, is a taking inventory of what's happening internally. Uh, there's a tool actually at emotionallyhealthy.org where someone can take inventory. Um, emotionallyhealthy.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Wanna, we just believe so much. Drew's a part of that ministry and uh, as a partner of discipleship.org, we just really believe in emotionally healthy discipleship and what you're doing, Drew and, and Pete. So yeah, emotionallyhealthy.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's actually an assessment that one can take about just the status of my own soul and relationships. And so again, that's just one tool to be able to take an inventory, but I do think an inventory helps I need to, because the reality is I'm often the worst uh, person to take inventory because I deceive myself, you know, and the truth is not in us, as it says in the book of Jeremiah, right? Like, and so I need, I need moments of repentance and reflection just to take inventory of what, what is the status of my soul? And oftentimes I will, uh, I will take the inventory and then I'll also have my wife take the inventory for me. <laughs> or if, you know, if you're not married, then you could have someone very close to you take the inventory just to ask the question, how, how does this person experience me as a follower of Jesus? And I think then after taking inventory, I think the steps of, okay, what do I need to, what do I need to, again, start to, I think in church world right now, for instance, for me, so much of my focus is on the great commission is like, how do I fulfill this mission? How does our church fulfill this mission? How do we continue to grow up to the right? But I just need equally um, an emphasis on how am I doing the great commandment? How am I doing in loving God well above all things? How am I doing in loving others as, as well as myself? And I need as much help in that regard as well as as much focus on the great commission. And so in so doing, I think, you know, the core, that's where the emotionally healthy discipleship courses came from, emotionally healthy spirituality, as well as emotionally healthy relationships, which together comprise the emotionally healthy discipleship course. Um, and it's basically an inventory. It's not only an inventory, but it's an exploration through the scriptures and with a community to really get at some of those core things, such as our family of origin, such as how do we deal with grief and loss? How do we deal with suffering and setbacks? Um, how do we routinely then live a life of rhythm so that my life is not simply a go, go, go in fulfilling the great commission that I've lost all semblance of this love relationship with God and, um, and, and with my spouse and the appropriate others around me, you know? So, um, so yeah, so those courses are really helpful for that. I know that that's part of our deception course. One of the funny things is Pete Scazzaro often asks me, he goes, Drew, why don't, why don't you empower someone else to run the courses for you at, at the church? And I'm like, Pete, you don't understand. Like, cause he's like, Drew, you've been through these courses a gazillion amount of times and you've done it with so many folks. And he's like, um, and I said, Pete, you don't understand. Like, I need this for myself. I need to continually be pausing to take an inventory of my own soul, take an inventory of my relationships so that I can become the loving 
you know, follower of Jesus that I'm called to be so that the disciples that we're making hopefully are shaped and crafted as not these hyper driven, which is what I can tend to be <laughs> hyper driven, you know, results oriented, but I need this so that I myself can really focus on what does it mean to be a loving human being? Boy, that's good. So are there some practical things, Drew, mm -hmm. somebody's listening and they're saying, okay, I get, you know, I know there's resources there. Mm -hmm. uh, are there some daily practices yeah. or some things that you could recommend? Let, let me give an example to our audience. I find that you and other people uh, who are emotionally connected with themselves mm -hmm. um, kind of notice the spiritual tone of things. It's kind of like you pause and it's like, uh, like you're engaged at that. Mm -hmm. But are there some practical disciplines or habits or things that you do yeah. just to help you be grounded in being emotionally healthy? Yeah, I, I think for certain, I mean, two that jump out to me is Sabbath keeping, a time to stop, delight, rest, and contemplate, taking a 24-hour period to do those things, to stop, delight, contemplate, um, stop, rest, delight, and contemplate. Because remember, I talked about how inventory, taking inventory is probably the first step. And it's, it's when I have enough margin in my life where I'm able to do this. I think related to that is the practice of the daily office. Um, the daily office simply is um, these monastic communities would actually practice uh, an office and it was daily. And the office was simply a way of pausing throughout the day. It was a rhythm of pausing to have, you know, God be the center in my prayer life, be really focused, much like Daniel, the book of Daniel, when he pauses at various points throughout the day, David talks about pausing at different moments of the day. You know, I grew up, when I grew up in uh, church world, it was about having a quiet time and you have a quiet time, you know, the first 30 minutes of a day or so. Yeah. And uh, the daily office, the way it's different is, you know, and for me, my experience was having, with having a quiet time, I'd have it, in the, you know, early in the day, get dressed, get ready go walk to the subway, um, you know, get on the subway. It's super crowded. I'm really irritable. And if it's the summertime, it's really sweaty. And I'm just kind of like not feeling really great. You know, I haven't forgot, you know, I've totally forgotten what, you know, I read or prayed about, you know, and then a couple of hours later, then I'm at work and I'm really kind of just annoyed at my boss and uh, having a really hard time and, you know, forget like quiet time seems like it was so far away, you know, by the time lunch rolls around, I'm not even a Christian anymore, you know, <laughs> basically, <laughs> right. But like what I've noticed about a daily office is taking these daily pauses is really a way to recenter me, to recalibrate me each time to. So when you say daily office for people who haven't heard that expression before, what does that mean exactly? Yeah. So it's moments throughout the day. So morning, midday and evening for me where I will pause to pray, pause to read and meditate on scripture, and I'll pause just to be silent. So it's a way to recenter me. And so it, um, imagine having three quiet times per day, mm. uh, and they don't have to be terribly long. One of them can simply be just simply a breath prayer, you know, uh, a breath prayer of just a simple statement of, um, I know that Tim Keller, one of the he said that midday when he pauses to pray, he asks the question, when have I been scared, cold, um, or hooked? And he wow. just- Wow. Those, yeah. those are three great questions. Yeah. And then he basically reflects on his morning. And was there a moment where he was living? Was he scared? And like, he was- scared of what people would think of him or he was, you know, when was a moment when he was cold where his heart was not soft, but instead he was angry and, you know, and, or hooked time when he got so preoccupied with something that he, he lost his way of his vision of Jesus. And I, I just love, you know, that those questions to just take inventory in the middle of a day. Um, so Things like that. Those are just tools. But if you can just imagine, you know, so it's not so much what you're doing during that pause, but really it's some mixture of reflection, prayer, scripture, and, 
and being fully present with your emotional self. Yeah, absolutely. And, absolutely. And, and not pushing it down, but bringing it to the Lord. Yes, absolutely. And being present in it. That, that is so good. You know, uh, Drew, I, I've been, uh, I'm doing a teaching this coming Sunday. And so I've been spending time looking at the, you know, the earliest church. And there's a passage that a lot of people will know. It's from uh, the book of Acts chapter two, verse 42. And it talks about the earliest Christians. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. uh, I think probably to the fellowship and prayers. uh, I'm sorry, to the fellowship and the breaking of bread. I think that's probably one thing. The apostles teaching to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And the third thing is uh, uh, prayers, which I keep saying automatically, but, and in the, in the Greek text, it says the prayers. Wow. And when you dig into that, it's like, you no, know, the earliest Christians had mm-hmm. set times of prayer in the day, mm-hmm. like what you're talking about. Yeah. So that's an interesting uh, um, synergy with what you're saying. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Can't wait to hear that teaching from you. So, yeah. Well, those are really helpful. So you personally uh, have three times a day where you slow down and uh, center in and and uh, have these offices that you're talking about? Yeah. And oftentimes it's more aspirational, right? But the fact that I am consciously thinking about that. I need to pause. Like there might be a time in, in the middle of a meeting. I mean, this was actually something that I caught from Schizero, like, cause both of us are somewhat, we're dreamers driven and we'd be in these meetings and we'd be kind of bouncing off one another. And then Pete would all of a sudden be like, we need, we need to pray. We just need to, there's something about this that, that needs to be bathed in prayer. And we would just stop right there and pray in the middle of, and I just realized like that was something that I caught from Schizero was just he was constantly just prayerful about those things like and and i think it came from that that idea of rhythm reflection and pausing so yeah uh let me ask you this other question because i've seen this in you and i really value it It, it's actually a way of communicating god's love for another person Mm -hmm. is to also engage them where they're at emotionally in light of whatever the thing is that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Are you conscious about that? I think you're really good at that. Uh, Are you conscious about that? Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly conscious of, um, I, I think the way of Jesus is a way of he's constantly meeting people where they are. Yeah. And with his own humanity and brokenness. And I think, my whole posture. I hope that people will come away from, you know, if I ever meet someone that they come away thinking, wow, Drew, instead of thinking Drew's a really impressive person, instead think Drew is a really human person who is aware of his own kind of brokenness and fallacies. And as a result, hopefully we can say, instead of, wow, Drew is a great pastor or preacher. It's like, instead it's like, wow, Jesus is really great. That, um, someone as broken and honest as Drew could meet him and follow him and still be trying to do the best we can. And that by doing that, you communicate to people that you love them, like mm-hmm. you're engaged with where they're at. One of the things that I often ask myself, uh, and I've got to, I've got to say it, I, when I answer this question that I ask myself, it's really been a good question to help me refocus. Um, But what is people's like of the people I'm interacting with, what is their main thing they think about me? Hmm. And, you know, in John 13, where Jesus said by this, all men will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Mm. And then the New Testament is so clear that the ultimate attribute of Christ's likeness is love. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've got to be transparent. I don't think most people would say about me, man, he really loves me. 
Mm. Like, I don't know a lot about Bobby Harrington, but I just know I feel like he loves me when he's with me. Mm. Um, now, sometimes people don't feel love because you got to, you know, talk to them about stuff that maybe they don't want you to or whatever. But I think it's a really good question. Like, what do people think about us? Do they think about us above all that we really love them? Yeah. And, you know, to the best we can in the social context and with the parameters of life as it is, I really think it's important that we slow down enough, like you said, to be conscious of ourselves and of them. Yeah, absolutely. There's every human being is so they're made in the image of God and, and they're loved by God and God wants us to look at them the same way. Yeah. And that's ultimately that would be my goal that people would think about me that they would think not whatever they might say, but they would, they would think, well, I don't know this about him, but I know he loves me. Like yeah. I get a sense he cares about me. Yeah. And I, I think you do a good job at that, by the way. Oh, thanks, Bobby. I mean, I, I fail miserably a whole lot too, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully that could be a marker of, again, just trying to live the way Jesus has called us to live. Yeah. So. Well, Drew, thank you so much uh, for your time. Thank you for this conversation. So thank you so much, Drew, and uh, hope that you have a great day along with everyone who has joined with us. Thanks, Bobby. Really honored to be here and grateful for you and even just sharing of your own story here.